Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back. You've just tuned in to Women's AM. This morning I am joined by Sister Hannah, Savita, and we've got Sister Shazia Afsal on the phone as well. So welcome back to the show, Savita. You are a consultant for Coram Baf. Could you yeah. tell us a little bit about that? Uh, Coram Baf is an adoption uh, and fostering agency, and I work in the research, uh, policy, and development team as a consultant that provides advice, training. Oh, that's uh, wonderful. Artists. And how long have you been doing that for? Um, well, I used to work for the British Association for Adoption and Fostering, and sadly, they went into administration, and I now work for Coram Bath. Okay, so you've ha so you've got like a wealth of experience. Of, you're a fount of knowledge, hopefully, today for us. Um, <laughs> well, we'd like to think of ourselves as experts, but experts need to uh, learn from others, and we're going to hear from Shazia, so yes, I'm sure we we're going to learn do. from her. We will do. So we've got our... We've got uh, Shazia over Skype. Salam alaikum, Shazia. Wa alaikum salam. Oh, mashallah. We know that uh, you have adopted as well. And uh, tell us how long ago that was and what that's been like for you. So we adopted uh, our son five months ago. Uh, the process itself uh, took a year. And then after being approved, it, uh, we uh, from the time that we saw him to the time that he came to our house, that was another six months. So in, in all, it's been a couple of years, but um, alhamdulillah, life has been uh, Beautiful. Alhamdulillah. Really nice. That's really nice to hear that life has been beautiful since then. Mashallah. And then we'll get to find out a little bit more about um, adoption and sort of the nitty gritty details of that as well, inshallah. So without further ado, let's get on with the discussion today in her views. According to the statistics from British Association for Adoption and Fostering, 5,330 children were adopted from care during the year ending 31st of March 2015, which compared to uh, the year 2014, uh, which was 5,050. So with 76% were aged between 1 and 4 years old, and only 1% were between the ages of 10 and 15. So for many over the age of 4, they may face difficulty in their bid to find a loving home and family to adopt them but why is this does being over the age of four make you too old for adoption remember this is a live discussion so please do share your comments and questions on this topic the number to call uh, is on your screens now or you can tweet us at islam channel hashtag or wham 15 so sister shazia i'm going to come to you first um, we find that muslim couples who can't have children are often um, open to adopting a child but sometimes debate around um, whether they can adopt older children um, why is there so much of an issue um, when it comes to children of certain ages, say from about the age of four? I think uh, the main issue or the main struggle tends to be uh, around uh, the, the mehram issue, so uh, for covering uh, the daughter wearing the hijab or uh, the wife wearing the hijab and so on, and because of the fact that the older the child, it, the, the child tends to need uh, more support and it can be more difficult for that child to settle in. So uh, most parents, most new adopted parents want to have a, a newborn baby or the younger the child, the better it seems to them. Um, it's it's um, it's quite surprising because you would think that a lot of the times you know people wouldn't mind what age a, a child is especially if say for example they've not been able to have a child of their own that they would be happy to adopt a child of any age but what's been uh, your experience Savita what are some of the issues that you've seen within the community um, similar to what Shazia has experienced uh, it's not just uh, specific to the Muslim community all uh, prospective adopters want babies but there aren't many babies avail available uh, the children are much older mm -hmm. and so I suppose we're here to encourage more uh, adoption from all walks of life from people from all walks of life to consider older children um, but th there isn't anything specific to the Muslim mm -hmm. community that's different apart from what Chelsea said everybody wants a baby and maybe some of the issues around Mehram and inheritance and some of those other issues but most of those have now been addressed so Shazi is one adopter that's addressed those issues and so have uh, many other adop Muslim adopters. I suppose in a way you do tend to think like you know if there was an issue with yeah. age besides the one of you know the mahram being an issue when they get to a certain age yeah. you do tend to think about as well you know obviously an old child might, might come with certain issues that you perhaps you know might not know how to deal with um, you know when you get this child in your home you think how do I handle certain things? You know, obviously the child would have been through certain stresses and traumatic experiences.
experiences, you know, you might not, you might feel that you're not equipped to handle that, so you want a baby because essentially it's like a clean slate. But are there any in uh, struggles incurred for those adopting children from the ages of four? Well, I'll just say that there, we can't make the assumption that a baby won't come with problems. Uh, just because a baby doesn't speak our language. Uh, we don't know yet what baby's memories hold, so it's not a given that if you've got a baby, you won't have any uh, highs and lows. Obviously, older children have had some uh, bad memories. They probably bring those with them, and they probably need an adopter who's going to be able to understand them, so they no longer have to hide their bad feelings. So that's one of the main things. The other thing is being able to understand the child, being able to put the child first uh, those are some of the things it's mostly uh, their bad memories of what they might have been through and also they've lost their birth parents so they now uh, want a new family a new parent and they're up for it really and so it's for the adoptive family to make that a special relationship and to give them the opportunity to be a family but like all children we all have highs and lows you Absolutely. Know, yeah. I think with with children, you, they don't yeah. come without struggles, even no. if they're, they're your yeah. own children. And yeah. I think it's it's quite surprising to hear that sometimes, you know, you don't know what sort of memories a child holds. So yeah. even if they are a baby, you don't know yeah. what sort of trauma that they've been through and how that would translate yeah. given enough time and, yeah. you know, with them being able yeah. to communicate. So that's that's an interesting point to, to consider. Um, we do have a uh, clip on uh, Can We Have, uh, Can I Have a Mummy and Daddy, which was a groundbreaking adoption series here at Islam Channel. So we'll just have a quick look at this clip. Now. These children may no longer be babies, but not so long ago they were the babies that adopters craved. When we think about baby P and baby Tala, how many of us would have given them a home had they been rescued? But by the time these babies reach three or four years old, the reality is that so many people pass them by, and that is the case for many, many children who are still in the care system. I went along to Tower Hamlets to meet Hannah Ahmed, who's a team manager in the Children's Looked After Services, and Fiona diaz Saxena, who works in the Adoption Support and Placement Team, to further explore the impact of delays. The smaller you are, the easier it is for children to transfer attachments, to reattach. There is also a feeling of rejection because children do tend to wonder why, say, their own parents have rejected them to start with. It's, it's like a crowning insult. Your own parent is not able to take care of you. And then, why am I not getting another family to take care of me? And why am I in this position of limbo from where I don't know what's going to happen? And I think the, that uncertainty increases their anxiety and has quite an impact on their self-esteem and confidence. It's it's quite sad to look at that clip and to hear that you know people's you know concerns would actually stop them from actually going out and adopting these children because essentially these children whatever they've been through whatever the issues may be you know are in desperate need of a loving home and a loving family and that could make all the difference in actually you know helping them to kind of get over whatever the issues are and growing up to be really happy healthy children so it's 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 quite sad to see that some of these things are you know hurdles that some people feel that they cannot get over. Mm -hmm. um, but um, what examples in Islamic history, Hannah, can we find of, um, of those who've adopted or of adoption itself? Yeah, I mean, the first example that comes to mind when anybody talks about adoption is always of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi and his adopted son Zaid, who we know um, was given to him as a slave, but he freed him uh, and adopted him. And, you know, subhanAllah, he was treated with such kindness and, and, you know, such a loving atmosphere that when his real father came to kind of take him away and asked um, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you know, if he could take him home, Zaid actually opted to stay with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because he was just so happy there. Um, and I think, obviously, Rasulullah is an example for us in every in every aspect of life, and this is no different. Where he's, you know, given this child so much uh, attention and so much happiness that the child prefers him even to his own birth parents. Um, we also know about how Islam encourages adoption generally. Um, the hadith um, of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam saying the best uh, Muslim house is a house in which an orphan is well treated, uh, and the worst house is one in which an orphan is badly treated. So you know, subhanAllah, by taking in uh, an orphan and adopting them, as we saw um, in that video, and subhanAllah, the image of that little girl Layla just when she was three and when she was six. You know, subhanAllah, we have a many of us have the ability to make our houses, you know, one of the best house uh, in Allah subhanahu wa taala's eyes if we were to 
take this step. Um, in terms of generally throughout Islamic history, other than sort of a, a few other examples of the Sahaba and their own relations, there aren't any, some people they say, oh look, there aren't any specific examples, you know, of adoption taking place. But really this just shows how general and how accepted it was for Muslims to be caring for, uh, you know, other people's children. I mean, me and you were talking about this before the show, Ayan, in terms of how in a lot of cultures it's just very acceptable. Um, there isn't this taboo that unfortunately many people in today's society will have. Um, a lot of red tape as well, which is necessary but can sometimes put people off. Um, we should definitely, you know, strive to do this and make the most of it, um, obviously for the sake of reward, um, but also because, you know, it's, it's, it's not such a big deal. I think you make a really good point there, and I think one of the most beautiful hadith is the one where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that what, who, the one who looks after the orphan will be like this with me on the day of yeah, judgment. And absolutely. I think we kind of uh, uh, forget that, you know, when it comes to thinking about adoption, um, uh, when it comes to adoption, that we forget how important that message is. Mm. It's not just about an orphan child in the sense that maybe they've lost their parents in that sense but children who maybe don't have uh, you know who don't have parents to who are able to look after yeah, them so it's yeah. very very important to look at that hadith and say you know what this is an incentive for me to actually take in a child and look after them because you know the reward of it is immense mm -hmm. I mean um, sister Shazi if I can just bring you back in um, when we look at the example of the Prophet Sallallahu and, and in th this hadith um, do you feel that um, it has an Im the impact that it should when it comes comes to the Muslim community when it when it comes to them actually wanting to go out and adopt and what was your experience I think the uh, the desire is definitely there I think I think the Muslim community definitely has that desire there they just they just need to take that step and it's having the courage to go one step further you know there's there's so many childless couples out there who would love to adopt but the fear of not knowing the process and not knowing how to go about things it, it that's what stops them from actually making that move from uh, wanting to to actually having that child in their house because that hadith as you pointed out uh, you know uh, who would not want to be with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in general like uh, he, the way he joined his index finger with his middle finger you know, everyone would. SubhanAllah, and what do you think, I mean, you mentioned that a lot of the time people, it's the fear of the unknown, of the process, thinking that it's going to be just, it's going to be too much, too personal, it's going to be very difficult. What made you kind of, did you have that fear? And if you did, what helped you kind of overcome that fear to actually go into the process? I did have that fear. I had the fear of knowing that uh, every aspect of my life will be looked into and that will be asked all sorts of intrusive questions. but. The desire and, and and the want and the need to be able to uh, have a family, uh, you know, was powerful enough to alhamdulillah was powerful enough to overcome that fear. And then uh, it was just praying to Allah for sabr and uh, doing my istikhara and knowing that this was the right thing to do. Subhanallah, I think that's that's really beautiful, mashallah, that the want and the need for a child was stronger than that fear and that you pray as well, especially, you know, you praying istikhara as well, asking Allah for guidance as well on this issue is very, very important. Alhamdulillah. And remember, please, this is a live show. So if you've got any questions or comments, please do call in. The number is on your screen. Um, so when we talk about, you know, the, the factors that you take into account when you're looking to adopt, I mean, Sister uh, Shazia mentioned that they will be asking intrusive questions. What other factors are there to take into account if you're looking into uh, adoption, whether that's, you know, whether it's the immediate family or yeah. even those are surrounding them? Uh, the main thing is to be able to put the child first. Rem remember, this is a child that's not necessarily orphaned. It might be a child that has had to be taken into care because their birth parents have not been able to look after them. So the main thing for any adopter is to be able to put a child first, to be able to put yourself in the shoes of the child, to be able to understand what the child might be feeling. They might be feeling a lot of loss, as you've heard in the documentary, and as Shazia says, um, they'll be feeling lonely and they want a family and they want you and you are the special person that could make that special family for them so the main thing is to overcome your fears is to think about the child what can I do for this child I can give them a second chance in life I can help them to achieve their potential and that's the, that's the way to go forward really remember the child and what the child's fears might be and you'll soon overcome yours I think that's a really good point to make, put the child first. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, even with people who have children, it's always the thing that they think automatically you put the child first. So this should also be the case when you're thinking about adopting, yeah. is to put the child's needs first as well. Alhamdulillah. We also have a caller on the line, Sister Tabassum. Assalamu alaikum, Sister. 
Walaikum salam, sister. I was just uh, thinking about the alternative to adoption for those who are nervous about it. Uh, there is uh, the alternative is fostering as well, which you could try and see how you feel about it, which offers a child a temporary home, um, and as opposed to a permanent home with the adoption. Um, there is more financial uh, remuneration available for fostering for those who are nervous about taking this step. And I have known single people not in employment um, at, uh, with long-standing health conditions actually succeeding in uh, fostering a child. Um, so really the decision makers are looking for genuine appropriate carers wanting to contribute. Um, and um, as regards fostering, obviously that offers a more permanent, um, permanent uh, home mm. where all rights and responsibilities are given to, to the person, all the parental rights and responsibilities. Um, um, in, um, I, I just I wanted to um, also say that um, a, lot of, a lot of Muslim children obviously are, are going into um, other homes uh, and they're losing their faith, as it were. Um, and that's just um, something to, to consider. Um, also, one point mentioned about older child. Oh, I think we've lost a sister. Um, but she did make a really good point, Sister Tabassim, in that she mm -hmm. said that um, even if you're afraid of um, going into adoption because that is a permanent uh, home for that, for your, your home yeah. becomes a permanent home for that child, you could go into fostering. Do you think, Savita, that that's a good way to go about oh, it, to absolutely. try fostering first? Yeah, we're short of 10,000 uh, foster carers and with the new migration uh, issues. That are happening there'll be a lot more families uh, that will be needed uh, including for unaccompanied asylum seeking children refugee children many of whom are from Muslim faiths and backgrounds but also that fostering offers you that opportunity to see what it's like but fostering isn't that easy because you have to be able to let go of the child when the child's ready to move if adoption is the plan for the child uh, there is long-term fostering which is also uh, good but it, actually I just wanted to say that if you wanted to find out more about it in the Muslim community uh, the local authority um, with Regent's Park Mosque will be holding an open event a free day and there'll be imams there as well to discuss adoption and fostering and it'll be sometime in November so I'll send the Islam channel the details Inshallah. so that you can publish it Inshallah. but uh, that that would probably be a really good day to come along Absolutely. you're gonna meet adopters and you're gonna meet foster carers mm -hmm. who are talking about their experiences like Charles here uh, so I think that's a really good uh, thing to have is actually to have it within the to have this discussion yeah. within the community and to actually bring people together so that you can ask those questions because yes. a lot of the times mm. you don't know where to start yeah. so that's that's really good mashallah to have the masjids yeah. included in this and um, we do have another uh, caller on the line assalamu alaikum hello assalamu alaikum wa salam sister what's your question my question is this that uh, i am nearly 68 am i eligible to adopt or to foster a child okay um so the sister wants to know she's uh, uh 58 yeah. um is she eligible to adopt or foster mm -hmm. Yeah, there is no age limit uh, from people to adopt or foster. What what they are really concerned with is whether you can make the time to look after the child. Obviously, uh, they, they're concerned about health issues, but as you heard the caller just said, even that doesn't uh, stop you from being an adopter or a foster carer. Just go for it. And uh, so long as you can uh, care for a child and give them your time and you, you can meet their needs, that's what really matters. I think that's, that's a good question because sometimes some people feel that, yeah. that maybe they've reached an age where maybe they won't be considered that they may be seen yeah. as being too old to look mm -hmm. after a child because people tend to think you've got to have the energy for it so you've got so energy therefore equates you having to be younger to be able to do this sort of thing so I think it's it's really good to be able to go and actually approach the services yeah. that are available to know exactly what the requirements yeah. are because it's not based on age it's based on your capacity to care for absolutely. a child yeah absolutely. I mean if you're taking a four-year-old that hopefully uh, a jolly four-year-old be running around exploring things and things but you know if you've had your own children you know what it's like it's it's also what support you can get for yourself mm. within your family network and your friends so don't rule yourself out just go for it I think that's yeah. a really good point it's about even the support network as well within you know sort of the the wider family so it's not yeah. just mm. husband and wife it's also about aunts uncles grandparents mm. and what they yeah. can do as well to help uh, make this child and feel at home exactly yeah. exactly um, sister Sh 
Shazia, um, I'll come back to you. When you were um, going through the process of adoption, what were some of the uh, factors that you took into account when you were going through the process? Were there sort of worries that came from yourself, of, even from the family or the community, where you thought, I don't know whether that's going to you know, become an obstacle for me if I were to adopt? There, there were worries, and I, I was going to say earlier on as well, there were times in the process itself where I felt that I couldn't go on. I was, uh, It was difficult. I'm not going to say it was a walk in the park, but um, obstacles such as I was worried about uh, how other people would treat my child. And as the child grows older, I didn't want questions being asked in front of my child where it would make him or her feel... Uh, less adequate or abandoned or um, different to other children. Um, but alhamdulillah, you know, with family support, with friends being there and with uh, my husband by my side, we've been able to overcome the barriers that, that were there and uh, we're a happy family now. Alhamdulillah. I think that's a really good point, is that sometimes you do worry about how others are going to react to them. I think when you've got family support um, uh, that, of, that is very positive, you know, it makes the whole thing easier. And even making that child feel loved and yeah. included is also very important. Because sometimes even with uh, children outside, when they go outside of the home and they go to school, sometimes children can be a little bit mean. Yeah. So you need to have that support there. Yeah. Um, and Alhamdulillah, we do have another caller, mashallah. So we're going to go to our next caller. Asalaamu Alaikum. Welcome. Salam. Uh, sister, do you have a question? I do have a question. Um, I just wanted to know the process in terms of fostering or adoption because I have been trying to um, foster for now nearly a year and I've called various agencies and they've sort of refused and said unless you and your partner um, come to um, the courses at the same time we cannot allow you to foster. Um, and unfortunately, with my husband's shifts and work, it, it just doesn't work out. So is there no other um, alternative in terms of, uh, you know, someone wanting to foster? Because I've just been sort of refused um, in every way, really. So it's sort of been a battle for nearly a year now. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's a sad thing to hear, but Savita, what, what could you yeah, say briefly? It, it is an important part because part of the uh, people that have said before that they're fearful of adopting and fostering and part of overcoming that fear, apart from putting your child, uh, yourself in the shoes of the child, is to go on prep preparation and training and that is very very critical because you hear about all the research you hear about all the messages from other uh, adopters and foster carers you meet other adopters and foster carers and you learn about child development and about what these children might be going through so uh, it, it is very very important I would say try again with another agency but it is important to try somehow it may be that your husband has to take and you leave sadly uh, that is one of the commitments you have to do there but I wouldn't rule yourself out I'd try uh, again maybe I don't know I mean I wouldn't say which agency you're go you've gone to but you can try the voluntary adoption agencies uh, you could come to Coram Coram Buff and find out about adoption. Um, you could try some of the other local authorities near where you live. Um, or I would say try a voluntary adoption agency like Coram. I, so, that's a, I think that's a really important thing. I think yeah. it's about having all the information there so that you yeah. can actually make the right decision for yeah. yourself when it comes to adopting or fostering. Yeah. And I think as, uh, there's a lot of things that we don't take into account when it comes to children. We just think it's about taking them in, giving them a roof over mm -hmm. their head. But there's more to it than just that. So there's you need time to have and commitment. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I think um, something that's a benefit with older children is that you've got all of that information readily available because the child is obviously older. You know a lot more about them. And, you know, being our discussion being you know about over the age of four and some of the the stigma and the, the the worries that people have around that that's you know alhamdulillah an advantage and to be looked at positively exactly and there might they might arise questions for, uh, from people that you yeah. didn't even think about before so it will be really good points to consider as mm -hmm. well for yourself so alhamdulillah sister Shazia and um, we're just coming on to the end now what what message would you give to anyone who's considering adopting that might feel that they're not able to or they're just generally worried what would you say to them I would say that, like uh, like Savita just said, uh, go to uh, your local authority or voluntary organisation, find out more. The courses aren't difficult at all. You know, they really aren't difficult, um, and they help. They 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 insightful. And and my my advice would be just remember, put yourself in the shoes of the child 
and know that their world has been turned upside down. And if you can help make things better, if you can give them a brighter future, then go for it. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah for that take-home message. Well, irrespective of age, every child should have the chance to be part of a loving family. Growing up in care without a family can have a damaging impact on a child, which affects them both individually and the society collectively. We should move beyond any stigmas and preconceived ideas and focus on ensuring that no child, especially those over the age of four, goes without having their rights fulfilled. This has been a really informative discussion, but if you've missed any of today's show, you can catch a repeat tonight at 11 p.m. or you can catch up with the highlights from this week on Sunday at 3 p.m. But inshallah, before we go, we've got, we've got a brand new competition for you this week, so have a look at this clip to find out more.